Good morning, everybody. Day three. We're just about to see. Um, oh, great! For me, sir. <laughs> Get on up. <laughs> I was stepping in for me, but she's our new um, moderator for these things. Wallet open to open from Renegade Peter. From Renegade Peter. Yes. Gonna come he's going to come on Skype now, and he's got about ten minutes. No yeah. talking. What piece was he going to do here? Jukebox girls. Jukebox girls. He's pitching, is he? Yes. Oh, great. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> We're going to start a warm scarf society. Uh, so we have um, this morning some pitches. And um, unfortunately, one of the people that couldn't make, get a visa to come into the country, Wale Ulutokum from Nigeria, is going to be doing the first pitch. He's going to be Skyped in. And it might be a situation that we can see him and he won't be able to see us, which is very exciting. He'll be um, pitching about a piece um, on the Chibok girls, and I'm sure that everybody's heard about that particular tragedy. But it was one in which the world responded to, and there was the hash, hashtag, bring back our girls. And he's had the amazing idea of producing a piece of theatre on this topic, the Chibok girls, and his company is called Renegade Theatre. Hello. Hello, Wally. Hi. Hello. Um, hi, hi. Good morning. Good morning. Can we give him a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Wale. Can you see us? No, not at all. I oh, wish I could. All right. But you can hear us loud and clear. Very clearly. Excellent. So this is Pei. So my name is Fumi Adewole, and I am just um, hosting this section. And you know Jitnike Jonah and yeah. Ricardo Peach, who are co-directors of Pace. So we okay. have an auditorium full of people here today to listen to okay. your pitch on the Chibok Girls. OK. So please tell us about this idea and how it came about and anything more that you feel we should know. Um, all right. Um, there, there hasn't been much told about the story of the abduction of the girls in the northeastern part of Nigeria. Um, there hadn't been before I wrote the Chibo Girls. And I felt it was important to chronicle an event that caught the world by surprise. You know, we're used to one person being taken, or he, at least here, you hear the occasional story of someone being abducted. But when a group goes into a school and takes 200 plus students, uh, anyway, it caused, it caused a lot of noise around the world. And so I decided to write on it. I used, um, I used testimony for, from three of the girls, from three of the girls that escaped uh, Boko Haram. They were taken, those girls, um, Hawa and Mary, there were two Marys. They were taken by Boko Haram. One jumped off the truck on the way to Sambisa, and two others escaped from Sambisa forest itself. And so I, I was brought in touch with them by an organization in the Northeast. Uh, it's run by a family. Uh, the Gazamas, and so I began to write a story based on their personal testimonies of what happened. I also talked to people who had been involved in the rehabilitation of the girls uh, after this, after they were released by Boko Haram or they escaped or however they left uh, that camp. So, um, yeah, so I wrote. And then I had to find some money to put the performance up. And uh, the delegation of the European Union to Nigeria um, gave me a little bit of money. And so I was able to put it up. I was able to put up the premiere at the Mizon Center here in Lagos with those three girls on stage along professional actors. That was the first time. And I got a death threat after, uh, I assume from Boko Haram. Uh, 
And then we, the following year, that, that was December 2015. You, you must understand that it's not a performance that can be put up easily in Nigeria itself. It attracts the attention of government. It attracts the attention of the abductors. No one really wants the story told, either from the point of embarrassment or, I don't know, nobody wants the story told here. So I took, so we went to Rwanda to the Ubuntu Festival uh, run by Hope Azeda, and we put it up there as well. Um, in that instance, we didn't have the girls. It became very difficult to have those girls follow us around. But the production remains the same. It has three professional actors. It has a stage manager, it has a director and writer. That's me. And it has a drummer. It's written in the form of, uh, they're almost like monologues. So it's a, each, each one is a story complete in itself, even though the actors interact with each other. Each, each one is a story. It can be, it lasts anywhere from, it could last one and a half hours, it could last 30 minutes, it can be excised, it can be put together, it can be excised or, or reduced, depending on what you want, but it's a small sized cast. It's also uh, a story that must be told because it shows the, it shows the, uh, there's a shift in the paradigm. People automatically assume that when people are abducted here, when, when communities are ravaged, um, when communities are ravaged and when people are taken away, they assume it's usually, you know, for, for the primary purpose is for slavery or sex. But actually, this, this abductors use it as a tool for, it's, a, it's an economic tool as well, because it arouses the sentiments of people, it puts pressure on the government, and they're forced to hand over money to those people. So the battle front has changed, actually. The way they wage war is more sophisticated now. Anyway, the Chibo Girls chronicles a terrible period, a terrible period here. There have been other girls taken after. And the flyer of the Chibok girls says, the kidnaps didn't start with Chibok. We just, the whole world heard about those kidnaps through Chibok, but they didn't start with Chibok and they haven't ended yet. So yeah, that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. Could you tell us a bit about what you want to do next um, with the production? Are you aiming to develop it further, tour it? Can you give us a bit, a bit of um, information on your next plans? I'd like to show you to the world. I'd like, I'd like the world to see it and to understand uh, the helplessness of people here. I'm Nigerian. You know, and I, I, for me, the very idea that girls could be taken from school, could be assured that we're going to be safe, could be abandoned by the military in school on the day the Boko Haram uh, fighters came. The very idea for me was, I, I, I didn't understand it. I couldn't wrap my head around it for a while. And it took me talking to many people, people who had worked in those places for me to understand for me to actually finally grasp it. It took me meeting those girls. It took them being on my stage and then being able to point out their classmates in the iconic photographs of girls wearing hijabs, uh, being made to wear hijabs and, you know, accepting, um, accepting the new faith and uh, their new calling, end quote. So I'd like, I'd like the world to understand this. I'd like the world to understand the, the aftermath of those kidnaps. The aftermath of the kidnaps is we have children that, and, and this thing isn't about, it's, it's not about a Christian or Muslim thing. That's not what it's about here. Boko Haram is an equal opportunity killer. They take everyone out. And um, now after communities were ravaged here, the people abandoned their children or they had died and children were left uh, lying in the dust or just crying there. and. Uh, you know, Christians will pick up uh, Muslim children and things and run with them, you know, to save them. Now, some of these children ended up in IDP camps, uh, camps for internally displaced people. 
And some of those children were sold. Uh, this isn't a very, how do you say, it, it doesn't paint the country in a good light. But there were things that, there, 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 were, there was a fallout of what Boko Haram did or what Boko Haram continues to do. Some of those children were sold. They were, they were sold off to strangers by people who were meant to be taking care of them in camps. Uh, so, a brother, a sister, so, uh, some 12-year-old girl, uh, an 8-year-old girl, and a four-year-old boy are sold off to strangers who travel hundreds of kilometers, and they're deleted off the database of a camp with a click. They're gone forever. No one ever knows. You don't know the purpose they were. There are, there are too many sides to it. There's the military side here, and all this are told in the story. Uh, there's the military side here. The reason, the reason some of these soldiers, our soldiers refused to go into the Sambisa forest. The Sambisa forest is 67 times the size of New York City. There's no managing it. It's much more bigger than London City. It's much bigger than Lagos and its waterways and all its creeks and everything. It, it spans countryside. I'd just like people to know, everywhere in the world, it doesn't matter where, I'd like people to understand um, a terrible period. Boko Haram is rated, its, its impact on communities is rated, its negative impact is rated the highest in the world now. You know, even though it receives finances from, uh, it receives finances from other, in quote, big organizations outside. One of the reasons, one of the reasons I couldn't be at pace, actually, is, is I think, um, is pressure, in quote, over this play, over this performance. It's, it's, it, we were followed to Rwanda, and this time it was by security operatives here. You know, every, every time you say, I'm going to do the Chibo Gulf, people are looking and thinking, you know, what's, what are you telling? What angle have you put to it? You know, what, how does the world receive it? It's just where we are. So I'd like the world to see it. That's what that's. Excuse the rambling. Yeah. No, it was an interesting and very thoughtful ramble. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you, you. You said something about um, that the story is part of a continuing set of circumstances. In that yes, case, does the story shift from different stages? Do you update it? Is there a change depending on what new information emerges or is it a fixed story to the story of the three girls there there are uh, the three girls speak, the three girls speak for everyone who's been taken they speak about the the betrayal by by uh the authorities i use betrayal because they were assured they'd be safe in the school by the principal of the school and they thought they'd be safe because there were, there were government uh, forces. There was a military in Chibok when the thing happened. So yes, it, it keeps, it keeps slightly, there are modifications to match what's happening. There are, it's slightly fluid. There are modifications. Some of these girls have become Boko Haram operatives themselves. Some of those girls have become Boko Haram operatives. Some have, some have the Stockholm syndrome. Some have killed on behalf of Boko Haram too. Some have fallen in love with the lieutenants of Boko Haram, with the uh, soldiers of Boko Haram. And so, yes, so it, it keeps changing. Some of those girls, I have a story of a, of a girl in the play, of a girl who whose suicide bomb didn't go off. She was a school girl, but then she was, she was changed, so to say. Um, her suicide bomb didn't go off and she ran to a hospital because she had blood on her and all that and that's when they discovered that's when they discovered that she was wearing a, a suicide vest explosives on herself and so yes when we hear things like that when I hear things like that those things are added to the story they are added to the story uh, and there are no girls seated I must say this there are no girls seated in some room waiting to be rescued Right now, there's no room where you know you have the rest of the Chibo girls. They're gone. They're scattered. They're dispersed like the wind. And that's another side. That's another element of our conspiracy here. There's there's nowhere where they are right now where you say you know 
they're in a room in South Africa and they're listening to uh, they're listening to the government and how the government is going to rescue them. They're gone. They're gone. It doesn't matter what the government says. There. So these things are these things influence the the evolution of this play. My last question is. Um you talk about being followed around by operatives. You've received a yes. death, death threat. You yes. believe that your visa was denied because of the subject matter of this play. Um, Not denied. It was just made. It was just made. Uh, uh, it were, was just made tough to receive. It yeah. was tough to receive. The procedure was. The procedure was uh, became convoluted. <laughs> that's that's a good way of putting it. Um, yeah. What kind of network do you think you would, you would need to be able to take this work forward? Have you considered that maybe you need a different kind of infrastructure due to the nature of this uh, play? You spoke about a particular union coming to Nigeria and giving you some um, a, a small amount of funding to start it off. Are there other organizations yes. around that you think would also be supportive and maybe we could consider stakeholders? in terms of this story that you're trying to have you thought about it in that in those terms if there are stakeholders i don't know them um i don't know them i don't i don't we i had our nobel laureate um professor wally Shoinka come to see the premiere of this production and he when, when i spoke to him about pace and the issues I was having in getting to South Africa, he told me how important it was that the the story, this was this was Sunday, this was six years ago. He wrote me to tell me how important it was that we we continue to tell the story. But I don't I don't I don't have the I'm a I'm a playwright and a director. I don't have the the infrastructure. The money that I was given by the delegation of the European Union wouldn't have bought costumes for European production. You understand? So really, there's nothing I can do by myself. The idea, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put up the Chibo girls in Nigeria now. I wouldn't put up the Chibo girls in Nigeria now. Uh, I've been woken by phone calls. I've had, I mean, I've had people fly out of the country with me to, uh, to, neighboring African countries. It will be, it, 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 the, the, what, I, what, what I, I would appreciate maybe a network of theaters saying, you know, we can do this. We can do this, we can support this. We can put this up. Um, but back here, it's quite difficult. I don't have the network personally myself. I really appreciate what uh, Nikkei did uh, and Pace, you know, believing that the Chibo girls would work well uh, and uh, would work well in pace in South Africa. I wish you had been able to bring it there. Well, thank you very much for your contribution. Um, and you've given us a lot of thought, uh, food for thought. Somebody this morning here talked about a combination of journalism and theatre. And yeah. the idea of verbatim theatre seems to be coming back quite strongly um, yeah. in Africa today because the contemporary stories are also very important to talk about. So thanks very yeah. much. Thank Can you. we give Wale a round of applause? Thank you. Wale, we're going to ask yeah. the audience for questions. So that's fine. Please hold on. Does anybody have yeah. questions for the director of Chibot Girls? My question is, I don't know how to put the question. The, the play itself is quite exciting and interesting. Would you give it to someone else in another country so that they perform it there, so that there are no links with people in Nigeria to avoid the death threats? For example, if, if someone says here, we've got a group, we'd love to perform that play here, tell the same story, is, it, is that an option? We will give it thought. 
as a production company, we would like to perform the play ourselves in as many places as we could. But we would give that thought as well, depending on where it was. Depending on where it was. I got, I got, an, I got an offer, when we took it to Rwanda, I got an offer from um, an American who said he wanted the script. But we want to take it to America too. And we hope to be, we hope to be at a global performance, uh, a performance of, uh, a, a festival of global performances uh, next year. So we would like to take it to as many places as we can. And basically, my name is already on a file anywhere, anyway. So, I mean, it doesn't matter anymore where we take it to. Uh, if I, I might not be able to do it here, but we can do it anywhere. Now, if it's on account of cost or something, we might say, okay, uh, we can't take it to uh, Uzbekistan on account of the fact that the guys there say they can't fly us in or anything. Yes, I, so, so I suppose it will be subjective. It will be, it will depend on each place. Yeah. But the actors themselves, and they've been, the main actors, uh, they've been, there've been two that have been consistent out of the three females. Uh, one had to drop out for or work reasons. They, they as, they as invested in this as, as I am basically. So we, yes, we would like to take it as to as many places as we can ourselves. We would like to be there, yeah. so to say. Thank mm. you. Any other questions? Yeah. I think the the idea that the gentleman here put forward is quite interesting. I remember when Virgin, uh, Vagina Monologues was um, being disseminated. It might yeah. be a case of the director or the actresses also going to countries, running workshops and doing the performance there yeah. with, with the cast on the with the cast on the ground that might be another way of disseminating like yourself and the two actresses that are involved could yes. also become yeah. roving directors um yes of, of the piece yes yeah that that makes that makes um that that would that would be workable i think that would for for example there are nuances to this thing for example um we've, we've been asked to come to canada with this performance uh, next year but you know there was a suggestion that we do this play not only in english but in yoruba as well yoruba is the main language of the southwestern part of nigeria but as i explained to them even though it would have meant more uh, a longer stay and uh, you know more productions you can't do the chibok girls in yoruba because it's not a play about yoruba land it's about the northeastern part of nigeria so the nuances have to be true for it to stay, for it to be genuine. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, which is the reason it would be good to have maybe the director there or a couple of the actors there helping out with some of those things instead of flying in blind. Thank you. There's another question. Please hold on. Okay. I'm just just wondering, have you thought about using other um, like mediums like to sp to spread the story, so like film or um, just other like film? Yeah, are you are you thinking about other um, ways of spreading? The yes, story? I am actually. Yes, I am actually. Um, I've thought of I've thought of film and I've thought of um, uh, even publishing as a book. But um, like I said, sometimes you, you need contacts in those places. You need, um, you need people who actually are authorities in filmmaking, proper cinematographers. Yes, I have. If I had the opportunity, it would be a great thing to do that with it as well, to continue with it that way. Well, it seems that's the last of our questions. So thank you thank very you. much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much.
next, oh, can you hear me? There we go. Uh, the next group up is um, the amazing, wonderful, always bubbly, uh, incredibly vivacious uh, <laughs> Shiam from the Domingo effect. So, Shiam Domingo. So, please, Shiam. Shiam will be pitching uh, the reel van hip hop. Thank you for that loaded <laughs> introduction, Ricardo. <laughs> um, I'm get, wh what I'm going to do, uh, well, firstly, thank you, Pace. Thank you, Nika, Ricardo, and the entire team, Ria, um, for this opportunity. What I have done is I've taken an hour-long production and just chopped it. So what you're going to see is very chopped into 10 minutes, and then we can chat for the next 10 minutes. So I'm going to ask that you go. Thanks. Isa en ik kaap gekreed. Woesmantaal slaven taal en Hollems maak het kreet. Mijn baaikje met pisan met die boesman wordt eina. Amako Sabella en van die galoen in mijne. Pijne wordt gedokter met Kreesus Bugu. En als Afrikaanse boeren met uh, kooi kooi bloed toe. Daar zie je Wat? Suffer for beauty, you know? Wat is beauty? Sê vir my, wat denk jy is beauty? Boerilicious? Hmm, so my gedank. Curvilicious? Jebo. Typies, die blauwig blondine. Hmm, wat? Nog nooit een kleerling gesien wat kan artikuleer sonder om te assimileer tot een seker kultuur. Het jylle al gehoor? Hoi, jy praat daar een mooi Afrikaans vir een kleerling. A mixed rice, a kallet, a brain mens, water taal praten. Clearling, mixed rice, kallet, brain mens. Speelkie, speelkie, sê vir my. Hoe sien die ander mense my? 
clear lang mixed rice kalat brine mains
Thank you very much. Can you introduce yourself more and tell us a bit about the production? Okay, so my name is Shyam Domingo. I produced and conceptualized the Real Fun Hip Hop. Um, and it came at a time when I think I was also asking, I was being asked to choose to be one thing, to represent one thing and go like, you're vocal about things, you need to stand up for us. And I went, who are us? <laughs> what is us? Um, and then at the same time, this opportunity came because I've been, I get excited about real dance because it's the, uh, what I knew at the time is the oldest dance, the recorded dance form um, on the ground in Cape Town. And what was magical for me about real dance that it wasn't just the traditional dance as done by the fire. There was a fusion in what it was, but we perceive it to be the uh, brown people's dance, but it had um, a lot of... Um, Irish influence in it, in terms of the formation and the, the costumes that they wear. So to me, that was already something that was mixed. And then when we started with the production, I wanted to mix as many things as possible. And as I see it now, it's still so siloed. It's still, it's, it speaks to one, um, to one group of people though, or, or one denomination in this country. And what I wanna see happen to it is through fusing like we've done in this production, all kinds of sounds. So it starts with the basic bow, which is again, what we knew of as the oldest recorded sound. Um, and then we, we bring in as many as the of, the of the modern things that we can. So the DJ's desk gets um, cabled like an, the guitar and other instruments they play as a band, they play equal. Uh, the same with the dancers. So yeah, that's it. so we tried to fuse as much, and now what I, the reason I'm wanting to pitch is to fuse it further, to start linking South Africa properly and linking us to Africa because we're on the same continent, but we're worlds apart. We dream about going to America first and London and New York, which is phenomenal, but we're not connected with people on the same continent as we are. Um, so yeah, that's the dream for the work. Any questions? Um, you talked about the fusion of dance forms, and we saw, um, is that the traditional Cape Town dance form? Not, not just traditional to Cape Town, but um, it, it lives in a lot of the, the smaller towns, like farming and, 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 and in the Boerland and those kinds of areas, are in and out, mainly outside of Cape Town, because Cape Town has become a city. So it's the traditional dance form that still lives as entertainment in those areas where, where not, not much else is happening in terms of um, holding tradition and art together. I also saw examples of um, some a visual artist uh, creating visual art on stage as well. Um, how does that link in with the dancing and other elements? So, so the, the, a, a lot of for me about the real funny pop was, the real funny pop means the rules of hip hop. Um, and the rules of hip hop are knowledge of self um, the, the ones that I know and that resonates with me is it's knowledge of self and it's um, collaborating creatively. Um, and that's what we've done. And then visually as well. So what we did was the visual artist you see at the beginning, he starts that artwork and it, he finishes it while the production is running for the rest of the hour, inspired by what he's feeling um, happen on stage. So then we bring in the graffiti element of expression. It seems very interesting that you've taken a hip hop philosophy and used it as a framework to bring together a lot of diverse elements from South Africa. Um, yeah, I'm, my own background is I'm, my heartbeat is I'm a musical theater girl that like I previously couldn't listen to hip hop, but I, until I started working in communities and wanting to, to so like the kids you saw yesterday, you, you go into communities and you ask them to perform and they do hip hop everywhere you go. If it's on the Cape Flats in the cities, if you go out into, um, for, again, deserted places, kids know hip hop, so it's what they relate to. And there is so, so many powerful things that people I know in the hip hop industry have incredible integrity. Um, and, and that made me fall in love with the power of the values of hip hop. And if we can teach the kids that again, the real core values of hip hop, then I think we can make changes there as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, could we take some questions, please? Thank you, Shyam. I'm wondering, uh, I know that there's been discussion with um, uh, QPAC, the, the Brisbane Performing Arts Centre, Queensland Performing Arts Centre, uh, with Fred 
Yeah, it Fred has, Fred has asked, um, invited the production to... Can you tell us a little bit about how you thought of reconfiguring uh, it or repackaging it for it to make sense to, say, an English audience or an audience that might, uh, you know, it may, may okay. not be linguistically... So aware of yeah, so what, what, what you've seen here was the very first one. We had one, we only did it one time. We had an hour to move into the theater, and we, that's what we did. Um, so we did it a second time after Fred's invitation came, and then what I did do was introduce English-speaking hip-hop artists into it, as well as a female artist that has, she's from Cape Town, but she's a lot more famous in Nigeria and those areas than she is in Cape Town. Um, so I put them into the production, even though it was at an Afrikaans festival, but they give me great freedom, um, and we tested the work to see what if we introduced the other languages into it, and it worked really well, because it's hip-hop, so you can really mix everything, <laughs> um, and it was well received as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, there's the lady at the back. Could you please come back? Um, I know what this production means to you, so, um, and I also understand that we need to stay true to the cause, and I feel, um, um, lashing onto what Ricardo asked is, is there a, a form of subtitles or um, AV or any sense of multimedia that, we c that you could implement in such a production to get it um, closer to an international audience? Um. I ideally wouldn't like to do that. The dream would be um, that wherever we go, we fuse with the people who are there. So if we go to Brisbane, if I'm not answering, if we go to Brisbane, what I've been looking at, the, their dance there, the traditional dance that Fred and them do, is in the red dust just like, and you can fuse the two dances of real and their dance so easily. Um, so what we would want to do is incorporate it with, it mustn't just be our whole cast going, and oh, this is our story. It's about how our stories come together. Um, so ideally, I would want to work with artists from that area and create the connections, yeah. And it's been, it's been pretty easy. Even with this, we, I mean, a lot of our MCs are not from Cape Town, so we worked remotely. WhatsApp is amazing, and Skype, <laughs> yeah. Before you go, could you uh, tell the audience um, what kind of conversations would you like to have with people here after this pitch? Connecting conversations, if there's anybody that thinks that you have something um, that you would like to connect on and how we can connect to take this further and even um, feedback from you and advice on, on what it's missing. Because sitting in this context now, like I realize that it's, it's not as diverse as, as, it, as, as I thought it was when I started it. And every time, like I, I said to somebody yesterday, the truth changes every day because you learn more. Um, so, yeah, connections to make it go further. If I might ask also a question, sorry. Sure. What were some of the, um, what were some of the reactions and comments after your performance? It was incredible. So what we did was we also, b my heartbeat is to take theater to people that don't experience it often. So we bust in people from about three hours out of Cape Town that have never been into a theater. Um, and they were, even though we were challenging the standard white Buddha Afrikaans, one of the most touching things for me was, a, 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 I think the, the auntie was a, o over 60, 70 years old, and she had tears in her eyes, a white lady, and she said to me, every South African needs to see this. Um, and that was the feedback from a lot of the people, and surprisingly, the very people that we thought we were challenging. Um, but it's done with love, <laughs> so I think it makes it, it, makes it um, absorb better. Thank you very much for that, Shyam. I'm, I'm just wearing a hat as any South African management. Uh, it's quite a massive production. Yes. It's big uh, in Very terms of the number of casts. Uh, just how you're going to package all of that and take it anywhere. Uh, you'll also have children in the production, so there's also childcare laws and whatever else that comes into play. Uh, instead of thinking of taking the production out, have you given consideration to touring the production locally uh, to regional theaters in South Africa, but then maybe working with international partners to bring 
hip-hop artists and other artists on a collaboration locally and to be able to give the work life and a further run within the country and particularly within the larger Western and Eastern Cape areas, but collaborating then with African artists and hip-hop artists from other parts of the globe who could come and then work here as a kind of reversal to wanting to tour uh, outside, but to allow real exchange to happen the other here way around. First. With the production. Yeah, I, I also, I agree that it needs to happen here first. It does need to happen here first. And the, and the magnitude of the, the cost does make it difficult. I'm very blessed that the kids that we work with are incredibly easy and their teachers are, or, or I have, um, of their principal, the deputy principal will travel with them so their education doesn't stop. Um, and we can do it with a smaller cast. And we are starting already. Um, Adam Hoft has a project called In the Key of B where it already mixes English, Afrikaans, and Hausa. Um, so we're looking at, at doing smaller versions of it of it here. I, d I do also have just the full length DVD if anybody wants a copy. I've got a couple of copies. <laughs> Anyone else? This lady? Oh, sorry, the gentleman here. Oh, oh okay, okay. He's got the copies. <laughs> Anything else? Cool, thank you. Please, a round of applause. Just double checking. So the the next one, uh, that the uh, the pitch um, is dear Oliver Tambo with uh, Sifu Manyakeni. Uh, Sifu, please come up and um, everybody a, a big warm uh, welcome applause. To Sifu is going to be <laughs> have to follow Shiam's uh, example. Go for it, Sifu. Good morning. They said I must follow her example. <laughs> okay, my name is Sipo. Um, I was not sure whether I'll have the control of this thing, but it's up there. I'll, I'm, I'm going to ask just to indicate and say, then we go to the next slide. I didn't know how to do this, but this is the best we're going to do. I'll give a sh presentation of five minutes at most, then have also a video, but our video is less, it's three minutes. Our production is called Dear Oliver Tambo. Um, okay, I want to talk about my company. It's called Smile Music. We work with a number of things. One of them is theater, poetry, and music. Uh, we can move on. Uh, in this production, Dear Oliver Tambo, we, we fuse a couple of disciplines, if I can call them that drama, poetry, storytelling, dance, finite, and music in a live band. Um, this is a history of how we came about. In 2007, we did a music show in honor of Oliver Tambo. I'm sure most of you will know the name Oliver Tambo. It was just music. 60% of songs, of freedom songs, struggle songs, have the name Oliver Tambo. If you listen to the songs, now and again, there's Oliver Tambo. As a young boy, I grew up asking, who's this Oliver Tambo? Because everybody seems to like him. Then I researched, I loved him. And I wrote this production. It was music first. Then we made it into a theater production. We funded ourselves from 2010, 2014. And then 2014, fortunately, Njansi gave us some little money. <laughs> I've learned to, to call it little money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mzanzi gave us some little money and then they gave it to us again. They've given it to us three times now to tour. We do very short tours one day. We'd love to do a three week thing. One day we've been to Port Elizabeth, we've been to Pretoria, a couple of small places. We would love to get more people hearing our show. We have a small audience of 100 people at a time, but we'd love to have people talk about it like Sarafina. My role model is Sarafina. We'd love this play to reach near Sarafina. Um, 
okay? These are a couple of photos. You can just move on until the photos are done. These are some of the images in our production. Um, we want, we realize that we don't have resources, so we can do it with five people cast in any hall with, with or without lighting, with or without sound. We can do it with 20 people with small lighting and small sound. But ultimately, we want to do it with about 30 people on stage, a full band, just like the one we just saw. We loved that. We just don't know how to carry it around. Because sometimes we just use three cars. That we do our best with the little that we have. We cannot wait forever. Okay, this is the setup. We can move on. And these are, uh, these, these are the characters in our production. It's eight people. There are always eight. The rest is musicians. Then we can put a couple of dancers to customize it. When we get to a place, we celebrate Oliver Tambo and many other leaders. We get to Guatemala, we celebrate Chris Lamin, because he's, he's from Guatemala. We get to, we get to, I don't know, we get to, we get to Nkanja. Wherever we go, we choose a person there and we celebrate. <laughs> okay. Every, every, every area has a hero, so we recognize the heroes in that area. Um, okay. Okay. This is basically the reason of Oliver Tambo, the play, to pay tribute to the men, Oliver, and all other leaders. And then secondly, to preserve the freedom songs. These songs that were sung to the struggle are nice songs. They're beautiful songs. They need to be preserved. I believe that. Maybe you can, you know, put a disclaimer here and there, but the songs themselves cannot be let go. I think American spirituals remain in force even today because they carry some weight of where people come from. So this is our thought. And then to hail unsung heroes. What do we want? We'd love to extend our reach. We've been to South Africa to a couple of towns. We'd love to go to more South African cities. We'd love to go to Lesotho, Botswana, and ultimately Nigeria. And then <laughs> finally, okay, when, you, when, when he presses the next click, it's going to go to the video. It's three minutes long, more or less. Hopefully, it gives you an idea of what happens when you've got limited resources. be some problem even if you can go to the folder and just click the video itself because this one is linked to the to the powerpoint i'm sure if you go directly to it
Renegade the art to the carpet. No. I will talk about Steve B. Basically, no, that's a sentence. <laughs> oh, one, one little thing I forgot. It's a story about a young girl who hears about Oliver Tambo, and she, she asks her mother to tell her more about Tambo and the values that he carried, and she wants to use those values to help the young people today to face their challenges. Thank you. Can you please go up? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very intrigued about how flexible your production is. It can go from 30 to 5, you said. And your performers, how do you keep them engaged with the production? Because you say the tours are not frequent. So how do you keep your performance, uh, performers engaged? We are a very close-knit group. We are always in touch with each other. Uh, some of them are from Bloom, from Chofra, some from Johannesburg, some from Kwakwa. So we always talk. The tambo is not frequent, but we have other little things we do. We've got a play called Pregnant Christian, a, a single Pregnant Christian. We've got small things that we do. The tambo is our biggest project, but we are always in touch. It sounds like you operate like a collective and you stay in touch and work together and thereby keep a spirit going. Yes, because we don't have money to hire staff, so we use friends. We are a network of people who are close to each other. When we've got money, everybody got paid. We, we were just in Gramstown last week. Nobody got paid. But we went there, spent a week there, did performances. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions to ask? Sipu, uh, we met in uh, Kwakwa when there was a kind of a co-production happening with the Dutch and uh, um, the university with uh, identities. And the community engagement there from the local community was just extraordinary. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the strategies you have if you're thinking of going into different communities, say, in a pan-African environment or even uh, um, internationally if there were people interested in Oliver Tambo, how would you engage locally with kind of key stakeholders from where you're going? How, how we will do that, I hope I understood the question. How we will do that, firstly, we'll go there firstly on invitation by somebody. So whoever invited us there would know the key stakeholders there, people we can engage with. But I think what's more important is to make sure that the story is relevant to the people we'll be speaking to. One, by including some of their leaders, because the struggle in South Africa was not South African, it was an African. That's why when people say, hail so, so and so, many names rise from Kwame Nkrumah, from people who are in other countries. So we will include their leaders there, link their struggle with our struggle 
to make the play make sense. But in terms of networking, I'm sure sitting down with the people who have invited us, who know the stakeholders. I would I wouldn't say it, I know. I've never been out of Af out of I've never been out of Africa. I've only been in America and Belgium, but I've never been in other countries of Africa, and that's why I was excited to be part of this. I was excited when you mentioned Nigeria, because I remember when Nelson Mandela was free, was freed, um, I was the artistic director of the Poetry Club in University of Ibadan, and we did a huge uh, performance of South African poets dressing as we imagine South Africans dressed. <laughs> <laughs> I look at I look back and I laugh at ourselves, but it was it was an am amazing, and we have a couple of leaders like uh, Tai Sholari that I'm sure we would like to insert into uh, your your production. Yeah. Have you considered um, an idea of education pack that might go to schools, um, maybe one actress or two actresses with an education resource that might go into schools and is there a funding system or support network that would support that kind of work in this region? We are looking for possible funding networks and sources. Yes, actually we've got a book that I wrote, it's called Dear Oliver Tambo. It's a book about lessons that young people can learn from Oliver Tambo. Young people love music, so when we do the music part of it, there's excitement. Even the play itself, there's excitement. And we also do, like I said, a smile music. We do motivational talks. We do inspirational speaking. When we go there, it's all part of it. It would be an amazing thing if it could go to schools. That's actually the feedback we get whenever we perform it. Take it to schools. But we wish we could. Any other questions? Oh, there's a Thank you. Uh, the money that you got from the Zanzi Golden Economy Fund, was that for touring or was that for seed money to set up your company and to get it going? That's the first question I have. The, the second question I have is, uh, when you do work like this that is celebratory work, have you considered trying to get endorsements of, for example, the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, uh, the Apartheid Museum, and other agencies in South Africa who can maybe input into the work, uh, both in terms of context, story, narratives, and whatever else, but also be able to support the work simply by adding their gravitas to the work. And have you considered that? Thank you for the question. The first question, uh, the, the, the funding from Zanzi was for the touring, touring works. Uh, I know their intention is to help us set up so that we can be self-sufficient. Uh, it's, 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 it's quite difficult because as much as they give us good money, but it's never sufficient because our tour, our tour of seven towns would cost us, for example, 400,000. And this is what they give you which is equal to the cost of the tour. But we are working on bettering ourselves. Um, with endorsement, yes. The first thing I did in 2007 was contact uh, Sistila Tambo because I didn't know about Oliver Tambo Foundation. I wrote to her, spoke to her over the net. She told me, no, it's fine. You do not need permission, that's what she said, because I wanted permission. So we started doing it. A couple of years later, we, we contacted the government people because we thought they, I mean, they are the government. So we're always given, you know, running around, yes, do it, but no support. Recently, I spoke to the Oliver Tambo Foundation in our last tour. They, were, they knew what we were doing. We were looking for an opportunity to come together for them to see it, but they know about it. We send them brief emails of how far we are. So, but we have not yet gotten in touch with them. Hopefully, we will soon. But we went to the grave of Oliver Tambo and we told him about it. <laughs> so, 
Thank you very much. And please continue having conversations with gentlemen after this session. Please, a round of applause. The next pitch we have is called Truth About the Truth by Sylvester Magella. And then the next one is Half Leg. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Half Leg. The pink couch slash Tara not cut. Not cut. Good morning. Oh, wow. Hello, how's everyone doing? Good, cold, I know, right? And this whole room is made of cement, so that's even better. Um, my, my name is Tara Notkat. I am a 31-year-old director, writer, dramaturg, curator, etc., 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 from Cape Town. And I don't say that to blow my own horn, I just say it because I think a lot of people in this room are their own writers, directors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel like it's a position that a lot of people understand. Um, and when I talk a little bit about the play, I think you'll, you'll, yeah, you'll see what I'm saying. Um, so I am from a company called The Pink Couch, which is actually strictly a collective. It's a group of friends who, when we graduated, we thought, okay, cool. Instead of sort of doing work on our own, let's have a name that when we do work together, of you know the kinds of things that we would like to talk about, we can sort of build up a little bit of steam. Um, we've done various things towards various countries. Hey, look at you! <laughs> Got like a whole set now. Thanks. Uh, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, and our mission from the outset has been to make to make theatre that we would like to see. So that's taken many different forms. My, my work personally as a, as a theater maker is very varied from intimate drama to physical theater to workshop theater to stand-up comedy to dance to illusion to opera to lots of stuff. And the reason I say that is because, you know, often, often in South Africa, and it was something that Shiham sort of touched on, people kind of go, okay, well, you know, who, who are you making this for? What, what are you doing? What's your thing? What's your vibe? And I've always kind of felt really uncomfortable with that because I think, particularly being a theater maker in South Africa, but I think being a theater maker really anywhere, you have to have a lot of strings to your bow. Um, and I think my thing or my vibe and the thing that I'm quite proud of is that I've been able to work in various different forms and I have various different interests. And I like to think that for at least a couple of them I have a little bit of style. So stylistically, my personal thing that kind of links all of these different interests together is uh, workshopping. Um, I really enjoy workshopping. I, Half Leer, which is the play that I'm gonna talk about in a second, came out of a workshop sort of environment and a lot of my other work is made in that way. Um, why I enjoy this is because I, I enjoy working with people. I don't only want to tell sort of my own stories. I had a really happy childhood. I don't have a lot to say personally, but I like, I like engaging with other people and going, okay, cool, I, I have a certain set of skills theatrically that I would like to hear the thing that you would like to tell or bring to life and let me help make that happen. So that's, I guess, bef to foreshadow the question, which is probably gonna come later as to what sort of connection I would be seeking out of this kind of environment would be that, um, kind of going, okay, here I come with a set of skills and I would, I'd really enjoy engaging with people who have things to say or have different styles and seeing where collaborations and things can happen. So I, my sister runs a hip hop competition, no, hip hop showcase in Cape Town. 
Hampton's most wanted. Yeah. Yeah, that's my sister and my dad and my mom and we'll talk afterwards. Anyway, but but when when Shehama was talking about the sort of hip hop philosophy, it's something that I've I've grown up with and I think uh, collaboration is really amazing and so something like Pace and being here is a really great opportunity to engage with lovely people like yourselves. So, half leer is, uh, for those of you who don't speak Afrikaans, it means half empty, which is a really cynical title uh, for what I hope is quite an optimistic play. Um, it's actually, the play is the product of five years of work. Um, it started in 2013 and it started in English, and like a lot of plays, it started a very long way away from where it is now. In fact, so far away that, again, started in English, went to another country, came back, and now on Tuesday afternoon at five o'clock, I had to remember that, I was like, is it three o'clock or five o'clock? I can't remember. But at five o'clock in the Cake Nets Ghana, it will be here in Afrikaans, which is quite exciting. Um, so it started with the actress who's currently performing it, um, it had a different actress in between who did the English version and now has sort of come back full circle to the original actress. Um, but the play started quite a long time before that with many a night on a bar stool in dark corners of bars putting money into jukeboxes to try and make the best playlist possible for two in the morning, uh, writing song lyrics on serviettes and which I then stuck in a box under my bed. So I, I'd go out sit in, you know, with friends, bad dates, various conversations, waiting for my best friend to finish his just one more drink, and I pretty soon ended up with a box full of serviettes under my bed. And so I pulled the box out and laid all the serviettes out in the lounge and started to kind of piece it together, sort of find common themes and so on. So sort of a little workshop just with myself in my own head. Uh, and it was wonderfully nostalgic sort of seeing all these memories or thoughts, and some were super naive because it had been a while, and I like to think I've also matured and grown up a little bit over that time. Uh, yeah, so some super naive, some of the things I'd completely forgotten, a lot of it was really dramatic, very angsty, very young, uh, but after I'd sorted through, you know, the junk and the stuff that I wanted to keep, I started to find what I thought would make a pretty cool play. So weird because I hadn't actually intended to write this play. It kind of grew under my bed, like your mom always says, if you don't wash your dishes or something, then something's gonna, it was kind of that situation. But all I really knew at that point was that I really wanted to work with uh, women. So the pink couch actually is me and a whole bunch of dudes. Um, uh, primarily men, I function really well in groups of men. So, I mean, this is, this is fairly, Fairly new, but very close to my heart. My best friends are men, um, and then, yeah, like I said, the pink couches, some men and me. When I was doing my third play, I got asked in an interview, so what kind of example do you feel like you're setting for young women? And because I was, you know, all of 22, I was like, you know, am I myself a self-producing young woman, not a good example, you know, in myself? And they said, yeah, but I mean, if you're just if what you're show people don't see you behind the scenes, they see what they see on stage. So if all you're showing is a bunch of dudes on stage, what kind of example are you really setting? So now that I'm a little older, I still believe that my answer is the same, but I feel like it's only the beginning of the answer. Um, and again, because people see, they only see what's on stage. So I can be as good an example behind the scenes as I want and have all the values that I want, but until I changed what I was putting out there, that's all that people were gonna see. So anyway, I'm sitting on the floor in my lounge, putting all my thoughts in order, and what appears is the story of a woman sitting in a bar waiting for a guy, which I promise that is not what the play is about. It's actually, uh, it's actually, it's a play about loneliness, uh, the expectations that society places on women in, you know, sort of from the good old 1950s, and the search for a real connection and an ever more connected world that we currently live in, with the ultimate 90s soundtrack to match. Uh, like I said, the play was originally performed in English um, with a really great actress named Rebecca Macon Taylor, who's just moved to Joburg to pursue a great career there. And it was a really great opportunity to grow the work with someone different to who I originally had in mind. So keeping with the sort of collaborative 
sense of it, uh, we changed things to suit her style, her personality. She brought her own stories in and we collaborated to see what we could make together. Uh, in the original version, it's called Last Rounds. It went to Grahamstown, it's been performed in Cape Town, Joburg, and we took it to the Blue Room Theatre in Perth as part of their Summer Nights program. So, cut to two years later, and I finally get to do the play in Afrikaans, which I'd always wanted to do with the actress that I really, really wanted to do it with. Uh, we got approached by Art Klopp, who in turn approached Ricardo at Freysa Kunstfiers. They pledged a tiny little bit of support, and that helped make the play come to life. And from, I mean, I'm speaking as someone who I think most of my rehearsals for most of the plays I've ever done have happened in a room this size, in my lounge, like moving all the furniture. I think people maybe understand this feeling, possibly. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads over here. Um, and it's been, yeah, it was translated by Amy Jafter, who's actually just flown to New York to do fabulous things over there. So it's, the play's involved a lot of amazing people who in turn have gone on to do their own amazing things. And it's been a wonderful process because it's meant, you know, every different person that's come in has sort of influenced it in some incredible way. And we got to develop it even further with Centaine. I'm a little bit older now, she's a little bit older. It matures a little bit, goes back to its original ending, which is very sad, so if you're coming on Tuesday, I bring some tissues, but um, I think what's been the best thing about it, and it's a bit of a weird pitch because I'm not so much pitching the play so much as what the play has taught me. Um, because it's, it's grown me as an artist in a, much, in a much bigger and much more significant way. So, as a lot of people in theatre can tell you, you know, it's easy to cast whoever you want in a play, but it's, I've started to feel that it's much more important, well, not much more, but incredibly important also, to concentrate on who you have behind the scenes. So, often I'll go sit in a theatre in Cape Town and I'll open a programme and there's, you know, as diverse a cast in every single way that you want on stage, but behind the scenes it's, it's a dude and a dude and a dude and a dude and... <laughs> No offense to the dudes, you're all really great, as I've said, and I like you all probably way too much, but, um, you know, except maybe the costume designer, that's probably gonna be a woman, maybe. Um, and I mean, that's not a Cape Town specific thing, that's the same in a lot of parts of the world. You look at the Tony Awards list, you look at the Olivia Awards list, it's, it's very male heavy. So I have spent most of my career being the only woman in the room, and I've always been very proud of that. And now that I'm 31, I kind of go, well, if I'm self-producing my own stuff, if I'm finding and making the connections that I need to make in order to make work happen, I should really put my money where my mouth is and change what is behind the scenes as well so that I'm not the only woman on this side of the table, that I'm actually sort of surrounded by more. And this led to my most ambitious project, which was an all-female Taming of the Shrew, which we presented at Maynard Ball, which is our annual Shakespeare in the Park in Cape Town. Um, every single person who worked on that production, from actors to designers to the publicist to the person who designed the programs to the person who took the photographs, was a woman. I employed 18 women for two whole months and staged the first all-female Shakespeare in 62 years at Maynard Ball. And the only way that I came to that point was this box of serviettes under my bed. Like, if not for that, I probably wouldn't be there. See, this tiny little play, which has been done in different languages and had this weird kind of amazing journey, has been made possible by amazing women. It's written by a woman, performed by a woman, stage managed, designed, everything. Uh, it has a touring party of just two people, so if anyone's interested, it's a very cheap show, I promise. But five years later, I look forward to not only where the show can go, but where, not only where the show can go, but the things that I will get to do because of the things that I've learned from it. Um, I'm not only interested in taking the show itself. It's, it's a tiny little play. It's not gonna change the world. It's, it's very sweet, it's very lovely. It talks about loneliness. It's something that a lot of women, particularly of certain ages, can really relate to. But I think what is most important is the conversations that happen around it, the things that people talk about once they see it, the things that 
if Sinten and I go somewhere and we do a workshop at the school or we do a talk for young women in whichever community we're in, those are the things that are the most exciting. And part of what I'm really interested in is, again, taking the skills that I've learned and from everything sort of backstage from producing to actually putting something on the stage. I know you're doing that walking thing. I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> Everyone else talked so long. Um, you know, and if that's taking the show somewhere, amazing. If that's a series of workshops, even better. If that's getting to spend a bit of substantial time in a place, wherever that is, in a city, wherever that is, in a town, wherever that is, actually engaging with people and helping them tell their stories, that's probably the first prize. So, yeah, will the play about loneliness, you know, change the world? Probably not, but I think what I've learned from it is probably even more important than that. So, thanks. Do you want to ask me things? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. The first thing I want to ask you is, does the play on Tuesday have subtitles for non-African speakers? It does. It, it, sorry. Uh, it does not have subtitles, but it's a very, very colloquial kind of Afrikaans. Um, there's a lot of it that's in, there was actually chunks of it that are in English. Um, the soundtrack is also completely English as well, which sort of underscores the whole play. Um, and it's, it's one of those, th I mean, you know, you go watch a dance production and that's, it's, it's a non-verbal language. You go watch something maybe in German and I think a lot of people can und still understand sort of what's, what's happening in it. It's a beautiful little human story and so no to answer your question, no subtitles, but I think that there is still a lot that can be, yeah, gained from it. Thank you. Is there any questions? Ricardo? Tara, thank you for that. If you, um, and it's a beautifully designed kind of um, uh, visual scenario that happens with uh, what it is that you do on the stage. I think the kind of tone that, that you use colloquially now is known as cyberpunk bisexual you, because it's got the, <laughs> the pink and the blues kind of mixing. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the set itself to kind of give people a bit of a visual around what it uh, could look like? And then also how it could, uh, uh, you said it's toured already internationally with uh, English actors mm. or, uh, previously, uh, how you could adapt it in the future for others also maybe to tour it internationally. Cool. Um, so basically what is on stage is a table, a chair, and we wanted to make it look like a 90s music video. So if it's half set in a bar and half set on a party bus. And if anyone's been on a party bus, I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> and I see some <laughs> laughing, <laughs> yes. Um, so it's, it's flashing lights, it's very loud, it's very poppy, it's very, it's a lot of fun. And at the very end, there's a six minute confetti fall of gold confetti that happens, which is probably the most visually spectacular part of it. But uh, the idea is that it's, you know, we're on quite a big stage, but the whole thing happens in a tiny little block like that. So it's a tiny little story and yeah, to, to speak to sort of touring with it, um, you know, we've been approached by different people to, you know, translate it, to do it with different actresses in different places, and I am very open to that kind of thing. I think it's great. It's, oh, even sort of taking, you know, the framework of what we've done and go, okay, cool, well, you know, maybe you would have a different story about your awful first kiss, so put that in there instead. Um, but, yeah, like I said, it has been done in English, and Tain's also able to perform in English as well, um, and we'd be very keen to yeah, to explore sort of different options with it. Um, I just have a question. You spoke a lot about your workshopping, and uh, um, I did find your description of how you got to the play via the box of serviettes, very interesting, but also very useful. Very useful to pass on to performers that make their own work. So my question is, are you plugged into any female collectives? Because that seems to be a theme of interest to you. And any... Um, artists, uh, freelance artists that you can pass or develop workshops for how to get your own play on the road. Have you, I think I'm asking, have you developed that kind of package? Are you sharing that kind of knowledge in any shape or form? Um, that's started to happen now. Um, the, the sort of, the sort of um, 
female kind of push and interest has been something sort of over the last like two years that I've put actual kind of a lot of energy into. And it's something that I would definitely like to grow. I have, with the show and with all the shows that I do, depending on what it is, um, have, you know, if we go and do it somewhere, there's a little workshop that comes with it that's not only, you know, the performer goes and does something with actors and then to the people who maybe don't want to be on stage but sort of enjoy seeing how it's put together behind the scenes, I, you know, you have a talk and you go, okay, cool, if you have a story, what's a cool way of breaking it down? I think visually, so I think post-its or serviettes. Maybe how do you think? Okay, cool, how do we make that work? How do, how do we help get this thing that's in here, you know, over here and then over here? Any questions? Yeah. Okay. I have a question. What are your immediate plans after the PACE conference? What, what do you want to set into action um, concerning your production? Uh, concerning the production, it, it, would be, it, would, it would be great to, it would be great to do tour it. Um, what we'd really like to do is take it to gold schools because a lot of what it deals with, I think, it creates really good conversations that I think a lot of young women experience. Um, and myself, what I'm particularly interested in is, um, I've been starting to look at things like artist residencies and things that I can apply for to actually go and work in other places and sort of, you know, not only take things that I've learned to somewhere else, but actually learn from different cultures from different people. Um, so immediately that's sort of what the interest is. Yes, question. Um, I, I, I'm yes. noticing a, the female theme, which I love. Mm -hmm. I just want to find out how do you want your male audience to perceive the, um, the production? Gosh, that's a really good question. Um, I think like, the. F Put it this way, like I, I don't I don't want the female thing to be e exclusive. So I don't I, I would hate if anybody sort of saw it and kind of went, Oh, I don't wanna go watch that because I'll be put off it because of XYZ reasons. I think it's it's a human story at the end of the day and that's it just happens to be told by a woman. It very easily could be a guy sitting in the bar, it very could easily be sort of anybody else and you know people will perceive it in whatever way they will because of who they sort of see on stage and at the moment that's who it is. And yeah, but at the end of the day, I, I hope that it's in some way kind of relatable to everybody because at the heart of it, you know, we're all the same on the inside. So yeah, that answers your question. Okay, just to round up Tara, <laughs> I think please have conversations with Tara about her production and touring it. But also she said something about not being a role model if you're behind the scenes. I would completely disagree. I mean, for my discussions with artists, one of the biggest things they need are producers, stage managers, pe dramaturgs, people that help them bring an idea to life. It's, I think if you are into acting or playwriting, for you to start thinking about how do I organize rehearsals, do the administration, fundraise, uh, think of the visuals, the set, which most of you have to do as well, is very difficult. So please have discussions with her about how do I get to do this and produce this because maybe there's workshop ideas in there that might be useful and de develop networks and forums where we can share that kind of knowledge. So thank you very much. Round of applause for Tara. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We're running a little bit late, so we're all going to go now to the sky and grab a coffee, etc. So the next uh, session might start probably around uh, 20 past 11, not quite 11. But thank you, everybody, for pitching. Some people were virgin pitchers. You did a fantastic job. Um, and, you know, this is kind of what we're going to be doing uh, more and more. So now that you're used to it, uh, uh, you, you know, you were also live streamed, so the world saw your pictures. Uh, so you might get some calls from America. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you for the tech staff here as well for your, for your questions and your technical uh, help because it's wonderful to have everybody involved. Okay, let's move it up to the skyline and grab a coffee. Thank you.